<clears throat> Turn with me in your Bibles, please, to Romans, the book of Romans, chapter 12. This will be our scripture reading tonight, Romans chapter 12. Follow along, if you would, as I read God's word today. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say, though through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we being many are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy let it, according to the proportion of faith. Or ministry, let us wait on our ministering. Or he that teacheth, teacheth on teaching. Or he that exhorteth on exhortation. He that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth with diligence. He with, that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be with, without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affection one to another with brotherly love and honor, preferring one another. Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. Distributing to the necessity of the saints, given to hospitality. Bless them which persecute you, bless and curse not. Rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. Be of the same mind one toward another, be mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Recompense to, man no, to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. If it be possible, uh, excuse me, dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Let's pray together. As a Father, as we study thy word this night, we pray that you would help us to a need be, have our minds renewed through the transforming power of thy word. Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So this morning, we talked about the fact that we are rapidly approaching the 500th anniversary of the Reformation, and that virtually all the Reformationists, even though they weren't all called Calvinists, vir virtually were Calvinists in their doctrine. What's the big deal? So what? Well, the big deal is that these doctrines of grace are such that they should influence how we think and therefore how we act. That we should think theologically rather than merely logically. That we should not merely know these doctrines but that we, they should affect how we think and what we do. So tonight let's consider the doctrines of grace and people. Someone once said, someone once said the more I get to know the human race the more I love my dog. Have you ever noticed that your dog is always glad to see you? Doesn't matter if you left for five minutes and come back, he's still ex as excited to see you as if you've been gone for days. Dogs are loyal. Dogs are dependable. Dogs are easy to please. Dogs are even quick to forgive and to forget. Wouldn't it be great if people were like dogs? Well, What's up with people? Why do we act the way we sometimes do? Well, if we know the doctrine of, doctrines of grace, we know the answer already. It's in our nature. We're sinful people. 
Every human being on the face of the earth is totally depraved. Deep in the core of our very being, as if it's in the marrow of our bones, is the sin of pride. The very sin that brought down Lucifer. We must be cautioned against it. We must be armed against it. This passage warns us that we tend to think too highly of ourselves. Most of our problems with other people has to do with pride. Their pride, and yes, sometimes our pride. If we apply the doctrines of grace to our thinking and, and actions, the Spirit of God will no doubt inculcate us with the opposite grace, that is, the grace of humility, rather than the sin of pride. The grace of humility, again, this is something that God has to work in us. We can't devel develop it fully on our own. Ultimately, our pride will not allow it. When the Apostle Paul wrote this passage under the inspiration of, of the Holy Spirit, humility was not considered to be a virtue. It was considered to be a weakness. I dare say, for the most part, humility is still considered to be a weakness in society. Yet, God holds it highly as a virtue. The only time it seems like it's a good thing to be humble in society is when we're bragging about how humble we are. A biblical worldview, as I said, sees, it, it sees humility as a primary virtue, and it was modeled for us by both Moses and our Lord. A couple weeks ago, uh, we were in the morning worship. We were reminded of Numbers 12, 1 through 3, where Miriam and Aaron rebelled against the authority of, of Moses and said, we're just as good as you are. We're older than you are. We've been serving the Lord longer. Why can't we have some of the authority? Here's the passage. And Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married, for he had married an Ethiopian woman. And they said, Hath the Lord indeed spoken only by Moses? Hath he not spoken also by us? And the Lord heard it. And then as in a parenthetical, in parentheses, Now the man Moses was very meek, above all men which are upon the face of the earth. Now the Hebrew word translated in this passage could have also been rendered humble, lowly. I looked in Strong's Concordance online and I could not find one reference in Scripture where meekness was treated negatively. Always treated positively. Jesus said that the poor of spirit were blessed. Why? Because, they're, because theirs is the kingdom of God. Now there's some motive to be humble. To show humility. Remember, Jesus said he didn't come to heal the, or come to save those that were already righteous. He came to heal those who needed a physician, those who needed a savior. In order to become saved, we, of course, we know we have to be drawn by God, but part of that drawing is the Holy Spirit showing us that we're dead in trespasses and sin. We're hopeless. We're helpless. We have to become humble. Jesus also portrayed himself as meek and lowly. The Greek words me, uh, here for meek is gentle and mild and lowly, humble again. So putting it together, meekness has to do with a humble spirit who is gentle. Jesus is omnipotent, yet meek and mild. Jesus has all power and yet is gentle. That's meekness. When we consider our fallen state, our complete corruption, which is interwoven throughout our old sin nature, and then consider God's sovereign grace, it should drive us to humility, to meekness. Apart from God, we are dead. Apart from God, we love darkness. Apart from God, we are deaf and blind to anything that was spiritually good. Providentially, we sang a song today. It took a miracle. It took a miracle of God's grace and love 
to pull us out of the mire and filth of sin. In Sunday school, I've shared this story more than once, but I'll share it again. Since most of you don't come to Sunday school, hint, hint. Um, Years ago, when I was a teenager, I I got involved in a conservation project near the headwaters of the Cooper River. We were supposed to clean out the bottom of the stream, so I stepped into stepped into the stream there, immediately sunk in my up to my hip in clay. It was a struggle to get out, and when I did, I was none too pleased because that clay stuck to me like iron glue, and it stuck. So I'd ride all the way home, several miles on my bike, smelling. I must have smelled pretty badly because my mother wouldn't let me get within 10 feet of the house. She made, she got the garden hose out. <laughs> it wouldn't let me in until I was sprayed <laughs> off. That's what sin is like. It stick to us, sticks to us. It makes us stink before God. We can take no pride in our conversion. Remember, we've, we've seen the doctrines of grace says that it's all of God, not of us. 1 Corinthians 1, 29 through 31. I'm coming in a mid-thought here. That no flesh should glory in his presence. We, we can't take pride in the fact, oh, yes. Remember the, well, some of you will, some of you won't. Back in the 70s, there are the bumper stickers. I found it. No, Christ found us. <laughs> we didn't find him. There's, we can't glory in our conversion. Verse 30. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he glorieth, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Nothing wrong with glorying if we're glorying in the Lord, not in ourselves. We cannot say we made a decision on our own to follow Jesus. Verse 30 says, but of him are ye in Christ Jesus. God made the decision first. We learned, this mor- we learned this morning, God chose us before he created the world, before he made a single atom with which to make us. Couldn't have been something we did or were going to do that influenced his choice. He chose us for his glory. But I had, but <clears throat> might argue, well, I had the wisdom, at least I was wise enough to accept Jesus. Give me some credit here. No. It says here that God made Jesus unto, unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Every part of our salvation is from God the Father through Jesus. Oh, but I had faith. No. Ephesians chapter 2 says faith is the gift of God. It's by grace we're saved. Not of ourselves, lest any man should boast. No, again, our salvation is all of God. We, we have nothing to boast there. We, if we look further into 1 Corinthians, we see, well, we can't boast um, in the matter of our conversion either. To the world, the matter of conversion, most people come through a saving knowledge of Christ through the preaching of the word. It's foolishness to the world. Well, God chose me, and I'm, I'm kind of special. I have lots of talents. No. No. Again, same passage tells us that God, for the most part, chooses the lowly. Do you see any senators out here tonight? President here tonight? Corporation, heads of corporations, CEOs here tonight? Mm-mm. No. He chose the ones that were that he could make humble enough to believe that we were sinners, believe that we needed a Savior. And he counted that belief towards us for righteousness. We might have great talents. We might have superior abilities. Perhaps you're a mathematical genius. Well, what if you, were, what if you have the, the intellect to be a mathematical genius and you're born in the middle of nowhere in Africa with no access to schooling, no access to electricity or computers, no access to any means of ever escaping the place where you live your entire life and die. 
You could be a potential mathematical genius. Never bring that to fruition because God didn't, you didn't allow it. God didn't put you in a place where you could bring that talent to use. Everything we are, everything we have, our physical stature, our intellect, our morals, our social skills, our standing in society, the fact that we even exist, our salvation, all that comes from him. How then do we too harshly judge others? But for the grace of God, we would commit the very sin. But for the grace of God, we would experience the very same failure. Ever heard the expression, oh, but for the grace of God, go I? That was actually a Calvinist, Puritan divine named John Bradford. He was with a group of other people, other Christians, who saw a bum, a drunk on the street, and were mocking him and you know, disdaining him. It was John Bradford who said, but for the grace of God lies John Bradford. He had a humble spirit, didn't he? He knew that it's only the grace of God that, that makes us who we are, keeps us from falling deeper and deeper into sin. Now, this is not to say that we should be downing ourselves. Oh, I'm a horrible sinner. God can never do anything with me. Woe is me. No. In Scripture, we always have balance. That's not God's intention here. We're not to be so humble that we're no earthly good. No. God tells us many things that should encourage us, should lift our spirits, but at the same time, we're not to take pride in it. We've talked about it before. We're in God's book of remembrance. We're his jewels. We're a royal priesthood. We're his ambassadors. We're members of the royalty. Sounds pretty good. Remember, he saved us for the purpose of us producing good works. We'll be more effective in edifying each other. More effective in winning others for him if we're walking humbly before our God. In the book of Romans, Paul spent the first several chapters teaching the doctrines of grace. Beginning in chapter 12, through the end of the book, he offers practical ways to put the doctrines in practice in our lives. It's interesting that the first thing he deals with is dealing with people. And as we read through this chapter, we see the key to dealing with other people is dealing with ourselves walking humbly with God, having the right opinion of ourselves, not thinking too highly of ourselves. So he offers practical ways to put their doctrine into practice. Well, first in, in verses 1 and 2, he exhorts us to present our bodies living sacrifices. And he reminds us that this is our reasonable service to the God who loved us enough to die for us. He exhorts us to transform our minds and by extension, transform the world around us. How? Not by being conformed to the world, but rather by being transformed by his word, the doctrines of grace. Next, in verses 3 through 8, he warns us not to take pride in our spiritual gifts, nor to think that our spiritual gift is better than someone else's. You know, God, if we're saved, if we belong to Christ, Every single one of us has at least one spiritual gift, if not many. You've heard Pastor Spencer say that many times. And I'm not, if, you know, if I have the gift of teaching, and you have the gift of helps, I shouldn't be going, well, nanny, 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 I'm up here teaching, and you're down there helping. <laughs> no, that's not walking humbly, is it? God has given each of us gifts. This body of believers is supposed to be building each other up, supporting each other, helping each other, growing each other in the nurture and admonition of our Lord. We each have gifts that enable us to help the rest of the body. We shouldn't be puffed up because we have a gift and someone else may not. Or think, as I said, that one gift is better than another. They're all gifts from God, the same God. 
And he gave it to us for a purpose. We need to use it. We need to develop it. And the purpose is to meet the needs of others. Then the remainder of the chapter, verses 9 through 21, he tells us how to get along with people. First, fellow Christians. Getting along with fellow Christians. Boy, sometimes that's really hard. Sometimes it seems harder to get along with Christians than it does to get along with the world. It's because we still have the old nature rearing up in our sometimes. We're not following the practical advice that Paul gives us. In fact, Paul, Paul commands us to do. It also, towards the end, teaches us how to deal with the world. In this verse, he gives us some very short, pithy, easy-to-understand commands. Let's look at them. Verse 9. Let love be without dissimulation. Let love be without dissimulation. Well, that's a big, long word. Like I said, there were short, easy commands. Well, there's one big, long word. Basically means, don't be a hypocrite. And the, and the, the background here is... In ancient times, in Greek theater, and then therefore in Paul's time, Roman theater, uh, the actors would wear masks. And those actors were called Hippocrates. So if the actor was wearing a smiling mask, you knew it was a comedy. If he was wearing a frowning mask, you knew it was a drama. You knew it was a tragedy. The masks gave you a clue as to what was going on, even if you were up in the cheap seats. You could tell what was going on. But behind the mask, even though the actor was portraying happiness, he might have been very sad. But you couldn't tell because the mask was covering his face, wasn't it? It says, let love, let agape, brotherly love, self-sacrificing love, be without dissimulation how many times do we we fake it when we're showing love to our fellow Christians that's what Paul's talking about here don't fake it make it be real <clears throat> but love be without dissimulation abhor that which is evil cleave to that which is good We see a similar passage in Psalm 34. It says, To keep our tongue from speaking evil, our lips from guile. And then it says, We're to depart from evil and do good to seek peace and pursue it. Very similar language to what Paul is saying here. What's Paul saying? What, what's part of that hypocritical, that dissimulative love that sometimes we feign? We show a loving face to someone and then behind their back we talk them down. We gossip. We tell tales. Hopefully it's not happening in our church right now but it's happened in our church in the past. How many splits has our church endured? How many church splits has our denomination endured? And I'm afraid that sometimes those splits were because we were not thinking others more highly than ourselves. Let love be without simulation. Don't, don't fake it. Abhor that which is evil. Hate the things that are evil. Love the things which are good. Pretty simple. And yet we struggle sometimes, don't we? Be kind, and right back to love again, verse 10. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love, in honor preferring one another. We're enjoined again to love, the kind of love that Jesus shows us, a self sacrificing love. Paul explains it further that we are to honor each other, to give each other preference, to put each other's needs ahead of our own. Paul puts it this way in Philippians 2.3, and therefore God puts it this way. 
Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let us each esteem other better than themselves. Wow, what a world we would live in if that was true. God grant that we can live that way. Next we see a surviving, a surprising statement. What's, what's he say very next? Verse 11, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Now, did he switch fields all of a sudden? Now, when you go to work, make sure you work hard. Be a good testimony. That might be true, but I don't think that's what he's driving at here. I think Paul, and therefore our Lord, is saying it's our job to love each other. Why are we so lazy about it? I think that's what he's saying here. We need to be fervent about it. We need to be enthusiastic about it. And I say we. Not you. We. It's our job to be doing these things. We should never weary in our zeal for serving the Lord by serving each other and others. There must not be any hesitation or laziness in Christian living. We should be living fervently for Christ. We should have a zest about it. Now, as an aside, that's a tall order, isn't it? Apart from the renewing of our minds, we'll never make it. But we have God's word. Our minds can be transformed. Our minds can be renewed. There's something else here, another tool that we're about to see that's going to enable us to transform our lives, transform the lives of those about us as we serve each other. You'll notice verse 12, rejoice in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. Paul tells us to rejoice in hope. What hope? What's the Christian's hope? We're going to see Jesus. We're going to be raised from the dead. In fact, our true hope is that we'll be in the generation that will not see death and will be immediately transformed to see Christ in the air and the clouds. That should motivate us. We should, that should give us cause to rejoice, a zeal for living. And yet, he kind of gives us a warning too. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation. You know, if we really live this way, we may have some trouble. People may take advantage of us. People may not like the fact that we're living for Christ. God has told us to expect persecution. We've seen very little of it. Is it because God is blessing us and being kind to us? Or is it because we're not doing anything that would cause people to persecute us? don't know. And what's the key here? Instant in prayer. The Greek there for instant means to be, that's several meanings, and here they are, to be steadfastly, steadfast, to, steadfastly attentive unto, never giving up, to give unremitting care to a thing, to continue at all the time to persevere and not faint. Elsewhere, Paul had another even simpler way of saying it, didn't he? Pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. Always be praying. You know, it's prayer that changes us. God may not change our situation, but he can change us, and he often does it through prayer. So he renews those, our minds through his scripture. We should pray the scripture to God. The Psalms are full of it. Lastly, in this section, we're told to be hospitable and distribute to the needs of the saints. That is, we need to keep our ears and our eyes open to know when, where, how we can help each other. Yet, for the sake of balance, elsewhere Paul worries, warns us not to be busybodies. 
oh, I was, I was listening to a conversation I shouldn't have listened to so I can help later. No. But we need to be attentive. We can, we can often see when someone has a need if we're really looking. If we're approachable, we may hear directly from a person's lips that they have a need. God may have caused them to come to you us because we can meet that need. But it's my money. No, it's not. It's God's money. He gave it to us to be stewards, to meet needs. Verses 14 and 15 are very straightforward commands. Bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. Wow. That's pretty hard, isn't it? I know my immediate reaction when I, or what my immediate reaction often wants to be if someone does something to me or says something to me that I don't like. Grrr. All right, you, I won't get mad. I'll get even. No, that's not supposed to be our attitude, is it? No. But we're going to have a tough time doing that unless we're renewing our minds, unless we're instant in prayer. Next is a little easier, but still something that can be a challenge for us. Rejoice with them that rejoice. How can that be a challenge? They're happy, we'll be happy for them. Well, we may not, first of all, we might not feel like it. And secondly, are we happy for our coworker when he gets the, the promotion that we wanted? If we're supposed to be, might be a way to win him to Christ. Not always easy to do, is it? Rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. Again, we need to be open. We need to be Aware, we need to be sensitive to each other's needs. It shouldn't be this way, but often we lock our needs up and we don't tell anybody. But sometimes we can tell just by looking at someone. They're having a hard day. Maybe we can help. Jesus put it this way. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Verse 16 brings us back to our thought life. Be of the same mind one toward another. You know, we should all be thinking, thinking the same things, basically. If we're all in God's word, we're all learning the doctrines of grace, our minds ought to be thinking about the various issues of the days in similar ways. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits, in your own proud notions. My way is the best way. How do you know it's the best way? Because it's your idea? We should indeed be thinking similarly with absence of conceit without having pride of self. We should be willing to associate with the humble. We're warned again, not thinking too highly of ourselves. Again, the way we think often determines the way we act and live. Lastly, in verses 17 through 21, we're given instruction about interacting with the world. Basic theme here is no personal vengeance. We don't get to get them. But guess what? If they need to be got, God's going to get them. Ultimately, God will make sure justice prevails. Scripture says, verse 18, If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Verse 19, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heat coals, 
fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. You know, it takes two to quarrel. So if we refuse to quarrel, the quarrel is over. On the other hand, it also takes two to reconcile. Now, we don't want just apps, you know, well, fine, I just won't say anything. But in the meantime, we're harboring resentment. No, we need to reconcile our differences. It takes two humble minds, two humble spirits to do that. If we do our part and there's still a problem, there's still a plan to be following here. Don't be bitter and resentful. Don't give that person the silent treatment. Do all we can to overcome evil with good. Who knows? If they're an unsaved person, this might result in their conversion. As we've seen, ultimately, God will deal with the issue. So to sum up, how do we handle people problems? Well, Paul tells us a number of things. Number one, be affectionate. Be truly loving. Second, be prayerfully patient. Third, bless your persecutors. Fourth, be humble. Fifth, don't take revenge. And sixth, defeat evil with good. In other words, do good and walk humbly before God. That is, we should be meek. Here's just a few verses that should motivate us towards meekness. Not weakness, meekness. Psalm 22, verse 26. The meek shall eat and be satisfied. They shall praise the Lord that seek him. Your heart shall live forever. Sounds pretty good to me. We're going to be fed. We're going to be praising the Lord. Our hearts will live forever. Verse 25, verse 9. The meek will he, the Lord, guide in judgment. We don't know what to do. If any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. That takes humbleness, doesn't it? It takes meekness. The meek will he guide in judgment, and the meek will he teach his way. Psalm 147, 6. We're supposed to be humble. We're supposed to be meek, right? What's the result? The Lord, Jehovah, the Lord lifteth up the meek. He casts the wicked down to the ground. Isaiah 29, 19, the meek also shall increase their joy in the Lord. And the poor among men shall rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. What did Jesus say? The meek shall inherit the earth. 1 Peter 3, 4, but let it be, hid, but let it be the hidden man of, heart, of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek, and quiet spirit which in the sight of God is of great price a meek and humble heart quiet spirit is in the sight of God of great price what does God tell us in the book of Malachi we're written, we're written in this book of remembrance were his jewels meek spirit is in the sight of God a great price thus we see through the doctrines of grace what our outlook should be we should be the most humble of all people knowing that it is by the sovereign grace of God that we shall escape hell it's of the sovereign grace of God that if we amount to anything in this world it's of his doing and it's of the sovereign grace of God that we'll enjoy him forever. Let's bow together. Father, we thank you that your word is full of doctrine. Sometimes doctrines that are hard to understand. Seemingly impossible to reconcile. Yet when we accept them, when we trust you, when we allow our lives to be informed by them, 
transformed by them, you develop in us a winning spirit, a meekness, and promise this great reward. Father, help us as a body of believers to build each other up, to uphold one another in love, doing so in humility and thanksgiving for all that thou hast done for us. Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's, let's close our worship tonight by turning to him 623. You know, Jesus, priceless treasure. We'll stand and sing the first and last verses. Jesus, priceless treasure.